So collative properties. Um, did we discuss throwing salt on your sidewalks the other day? Driveways or anything like that? That didn't happen? Okay. We'll come back to that then. Um, let me just define what a colligative property is before we go forward. Um, there's a number of colligative properties. We're only going to look at two specifically in this class. I'm going to mention the rest of them. Um, colligative properties are properties that are influenced by the amount of solute in a solution but not the identity first day that I started solutions, we talked about the electrolytic properties of solutions, or the ability of solutions to conduct electricity. <coughs> okay? That depended not only on the amount of ions that were present, that you guys saw the light bulb that either dim or not very, or very bright, depending on the amount of stuff that was ions that were there. It also depended on the nature of the solution, or the solvent, whether or uh, solute whether it was a non-electrolyte, a weak electrolyte, or a strong electrolyte, okay? In this scenario with colligative properties, it only depends on the amount of stuff that's dissolved in there. It's not influenced by what type of stuff it is. So I'm gonna go through some examples. Um, here are some examples of colligative properties. The first one is called the Tyndall effect. You may or may not have been introduced to that concept before. Does anyone recognize that? It may have happened in physical science, maybe not. Okay. Um, this one, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, well, maybe not the phrase osmotic pressure, but osmosis anyway. You guys studied that in biology fairly, fairly well, I think, didn't you? Turger pressure, did you guys ever do anything with turger pressure? Same idea, okay. Um, BP stands for boiling point, FP stands for freezing point. So boiling point elevation, freezing point depression. There are more. I'm not gonna go into any more in this class, and the only ones we're gonna spend a significant amount of time with are this one and this one. Okay, now let's talk about what this Tyndall effect is really, or really quickly, because this is something that you've all experienced you know what it was. Um, has anyone ever been driving and or have ridden in a car at night when it's been foggy? Probably all of you. How easily is that done? What's the problem with driving at night when it's foggy? Can't see, Can't see very well. Can you drive at night when it's not foggy? Can you see very well then? So what's the problem when it's foggy? What's that? Why not? Because it's dark and it's foggy. What happens to the light from your headlights? It scatters everywhere, right? When it's not foggy, go down the road. When it's foggy, that light just goes everywhere, doesn't it? That's called the Tyndall effect. The light is being scattered by water. You guys know water or fog is water drop. Right? Really, really tiny water droplets. So the, the, the light is hitting the water drop, droplets and reflecting off in who knows where. Goes everywhere, right? You just can't see that far down the road. Now, does anyone, and I know here in Ohio we don't get this opportunity very often, has anyone ever tried to drive at night through a really smoky environment? Now, again, in Ohio, that doesn't happen very often. If you live out in California, happens all the time. Why is that? Oh, 
horse riders and stuff around there. And the same thing can be said for like Colorado and you know, wherever there's some other states who are doing this. But anyway, guess what happens if you try to draw through, drive through a really smoky environment at night? Exactly the same thing. What is, we already said fog is water droplets, right? What is smoke? This is always kind of funny. By the time you guys get to be here, you're still not fully aware. No, it's not oxygen. You can't, it's oxygen to gas. You can't see it. Ash. Really tiny particles of solid. Really small solid particles. Okay? Is what smoke is. Uh, fog is liquid particles. Smoke is solid particles. Same thing happens. The light gets scattered. So again, it doesn't depend on the nature of what it is. It's how much is there. Now, have you ever driven through fog when it's not really foggy? Can you see? Mostly. You know what I'm saying? So it depends on the amount, not what it is. Yes? Why are they suggesting you don't drive through the bright side? Well, the bright lights, um, one, are aimed higher, so it goes further down the road. And two, it's just, too, it's just so much more light that guess what happens to it? It gets reflected more. So you want you want to use your low low beams that are directed more downward, so you can see more in front of you, and so it doesn't get reflected as much. Honestly, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, it does, but it's not that much. Anybody have fog lights? Yeah. Yeah. Like Where are they? Very far. On the very bottom of the car. Again, directed low, so it doesn't get reflected way up into your eyes. Essentially, it still it helps a little bit, not that. Much. All right, anyway, moving on. Osmotic pressure. Um, you're aware of osmosis. I want to talk about what osmotic pressure refers to. Um, we already talked about this once this year. Remember, osmosis occurs through a semi, or did you guys call it selectively permeable membrane? Maybe both. Doesn't remember. OK. Well, anyway, so we have this membrane in which maybe there are some pieces of solute that are on one side of the membrane, maybe a few more over here, dissolved in, let's say, some water. All right. Which side is more concentrated? The right side, more solute. Would you agree? What is this system going to do, attempt to do? Equalize the concentration. How is it going to equalize the concentration? And this is where you guys mess this up once in a while. What's, hap what's going to happen? Water. Water is going to move from here to here. Why the water molecules? Why not the solute particles going this way? Because they're too big. They can't fit through the little spaces. However, the water molecules, as you know, are very, very small molecules, right? They can easily fit through those little spaces. So the water molecules are going to migrate over here, OK? That's creating a pressure as it crosses this barrier here. And the more concentrated this is, the more the water is going to want to come over here the higher the pressure. That's where the phrase osmotic pressure comes into play. OK. There's also a formula that goes with that, a simple three variable wave formula. We're not going to deal with that one in this class. We've got other things to do. All right. Um, freezing point or boiling point elevation, freezing point depression. Um, great example of this is when you guys throw salt on your sidewalks in the winter. Now, your first answer is wrong, but say it anyway so we can get it out of the way. Why do you throw salt on your sidewalks when it's icy? Go ahead and say it, to melt the ice. That's wrong. But it's OK. We're going to fix it, OK? What's actually happening is the water is not refreezing. As it turns out, with ice, no matter, the, no matter what the temperature of the ice is, it is constantly melting. If it's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, the ice is melting. But as long as it's below 32 degrees Celsius, guess what happens to that water? It refreezes. So there's this constant back and forth. Melts, refreezes, melts, refreezes. Okay? 
But any time you dissolve anything in water, again, doesn't in, in, not influenced by the nature, but the identity of it. Any time you uh, um, dissolve anything in any liquid, it lowers the freezing point. So if you throw a bunch of salt out there on your sidewalk, the, the ice melts, it dissolves some of the salt, and lowers the freezing point. So now it freezes at a lower temperature, and it doesn't refreeze. See where I'm going with that? OK. Now, and that's remember we did the sodium chloride up here and the calcium chloride as examples for uh, electrolytic solutions, OK? Remember, sodium chloride gave us two particles, or calcium chloride gave us three particles. Calcium chloride works better because you're getting more particles. Remember, it depends on the amount of stuff you're dissolving. Sugar would work. Why don't we use sugar? Well, remember, sugar is a non-electrolyte. For every one molecule of sugar, how many molecules that dissolve? How many particles did we get? One. It didn't dissociate. So we're not getting as many particles. Plus, there's a practical aspect of throwing sugar on your sidewalks to melt ice. Where's it going to end up? Still on your floors in a big sticky mess when you track that inside. Wouldn't you agree? Plus, it's a lot more expensive than salt. Um, moving on. A couple equations. Well, actually, one equation that we're going to use for both of these. Remember I said freezing point depression lowers the freezing point. Boiling point elevation raises the freezing point. Or sorry about that, boiling point. So basically, anytime you dissolve something in a liquid, it extends the liquid range. Here's another example that you guys might be familiar with. Has anyone ever heard of the phrase? Phrase antifreeze. Associated with what? Your cars? Okay. What's another word that you may have used for antifreeze? Coolant? Has anyone ever heard that? Kind of implies two different things, doesn't it? With coolant, you're trying to prevent it from overheating, but with antifreeze, you're trying to prevent it from freezing. It's the same stuff. Anytime you dissolve anything in, in a liquid, it extends the liquid range. You following? So you can call it either one you want. The, the stuff's actually called ethylene glycol. I don't know if you knew that before or not. Okay? Interesting fun fact, uh, not really that fun of a fact. Um, if you have cats or dogs or gerbils or whatever it is you have at your home, okay, and you accidentally spill some antifreeze on the garage floor or the driveway or something like that, please clean it up immediately. The reason for that is the stuff's incredibly poisonous. However, animals like it because it tastes sweet. So they see a pile of that stuff on the floor. Anybody got dogs? Your dogs try to eat anything? Sometimes they even eat their own poop. <laughs> okay? What? You haven't seen that before yet? <laughs> okay? Dogs will eat anything. They're going to come up to that stuff, see that stuff, they're going to lick it. Ooh, sweet. Here, you know, literally. And then die. So, if you ever spill any of that stuff on somewhere, clean it up. Moving on. Oh, a couple equations, as I was saying. Um, so they're very simple, three variable equations. For the freezing point depression, the equation looks like this. And for the boiling point elevation, The equation looks like this. So what can you say about those two equations? They're the same. Okay? Now, oh, this is where this is about the only place you can screw this up. What does this mean? Change in temperature. 
When you're using this equation to solve for delta T or change in temperature, that's not your answer. We're changing the freezing point. We're changing the boiling point. So you're either going to have to add or subtract from the normal freezing point and the normal boiling point. See where I'm going with this? Okay. So for water, what is the normal boiling point? 100 degrees Celsius. So when I solve for delta T, what am I going to do with that answer? We're going to add it to the 100 degrees Celsius. See where I'm going with this? Remember with freezing point depression, what's the freezing point, normal freezing point of water? Zero degrees Celsius. So we're going to take that answer and subtract it from zero Celsius. You following there? Now, if it's something other than water, you will have to be provided with those boiling points and freezing points, so you can do the addition and subtract. But you, are you following what's going on there? That's about the only place that you guys are going to screw this up, is for getting to do the addition or subtraction, depending on what you want to do. Um, so we already know what this is. Um, hopefully you guys all recognize what the lowercase m is. Molality. Molality. Okay. So this is how we're working molality into this thing. If you recall from yesterday, I said that molality is a temperature independent unit of concentration. Why do we want it to be temperature independent? Because we are changing the temperature intentionally. You see where I'm going with that? So we need to find something the concentration unit isn't going to change because now we've got two things we're changing. Um, now the Ks. These are the constants. Boiling point constant, freezing point constant. Every solvent, uh, every solvent has its own set of freezing point constant and boiling point constant. I'm going to tell you what water is here in a second because most of the things we're going to deal with water. Um, there are going to be some, though, that aren't water, which have a different set of constants. Those will be provided in the problem. Some or give it a chart somehow or other. Okay? Um, but they are, as I said earlier, constants. You guys already know how to deal with constants. We dealt with the ideal gas constant. Okay, moving on. The units for the constant are and it doesn't matter whether it's freezing point or boiling point, it's the same thing. Ends up being degrees Celsius per molal. Now, for water, let's do the KF for water, equals 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Now, I'm telling you this. Did I hand out the equation sheets to you guys yesterday? I did not. You, you know of the equation sheet, right? That's also on the equation sheet. So you don't have to memorize any of the constants. Okay. For um, the boiling point constant for water, it is 0 0.512 degrees Celsius per molar. Now, there are going to be times, though, that we're going to use this equation in an expanded form. In which case, a lot of times, it's nice to look at this unit as 1.86 degrees Celsius kilogram per mole. Because, remember that, Molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Remember how we took the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, and blew it up so that we could get moles and mass in it? I just did the same thing here. Now, here's the beauty of this equation. 
Molar mass. What's the unit for molar mass? We've done it like four times this year. Grams per mole. If I were able to take a solute and pour it into a liquid, could I keep track of what mass of solute I put into the liquid? Very easy. I can measure the mass, dump it in, right? Now, what's going to happen to that liquid after I add the solute? What's going to happen to its freezing point? It's going to lower. Can I keep track of the new freezing point? Sure. Do I always know K? Yes. Can I keep track of how much solvent, water, I had in there? Yes. If I know those three things, what can I find? Moles. This is another way we can find the molar mass of an unknown substance. By dumping it in some liquid, finding out how the freezing point or the boiling point changes, manipulate some numbers, find the molar mass. Isn't that cool? We are able to do some real chemistry now. Oh, shit, a bunch. And that is with million dollar machines that you just throw the stuff in and it spits out the information. We don't have this. Hold on. As you know, assignment number two is due tomorrow, right? Um, half of number one and numbers four, five, and six are over this stuff. Good luck. See you then.